that race had my heart in my throat, my temples pounding, blood rushing to my head. And that was the feeling that I wanted for the rest of my life. I gamble and gamble. I love action. I'm sick. Hello, I'm Fred Noriega. It's common knowledge that the odds favor the house, but we all would like to believe that today is our lucky day. And 100 million people each year are willing to bet at least a few dollars that that's so. Unfortunately, for six to 10 million people nationwide, their gambling is a compulsion, a habit that takes precedence over everything else in their lives and for which they and their families pay dearly. And that night, you do the same thing. You call your line in, your wife's got dinner on the table, and she wants to eat. Why does she want to eat at the time when you're going to watch all the games on a TV at 7 o'clock? This man is a member of Gamblers Anonymous, a self-help group for compulsive gamblers who are trying to arrest their cravings for gambling. And then when you get all your scores, then you sit down and you eat, and then what do you do? Then you got your action to call in before the Star Spangled Banner, before the Mets, the Yankees, or whoever, at 8 o'clock. I'm Marie Torrey. Compulsive gambling is known as the invisible disease because in most cases, it is not possible to look at a person and determine that behind the facade is a troubled individual with an emotional disorder. Ironically, funding for treatment of compulsive gambling also may be called invisible, or pretty close to it, mainly because there is active disagreement as to who should pay for that kind of therapy. Later in this program, parties on both sides of the compulsive gambling tragedy go on the record with candid views. Fred? On this edition of Channel 2, The People, we will explore the lure of gambling, and in particular, the plight of the compulsive gambler. means more than your life. When I had to face my, my family and problems, I would go gamble. The outcome of that race had my heart in my throat, my temples pounding, blood rushing to my head, and that was the feeling that I wanted for the rest of my life. Sometimes it's a feeling of harmony with the stars. Sometimes it's an impulsive act, and sometimes it's a calculated risk. For whatever reason, 100 million Americans gamble. While gambling is just a sometime thing for the majority of players, for some, like Vince Mazio, it's part of their daily routines. When I watch a race, I, I do get excited. I root my horse in. Of course, when he gets over the finish line first, I'm really very happy. <laughs> Most gamblers lose more than they win. While this might not curb their appetites for gambling, it must make a dent on at least some of their pocketbooks. Last year alone, the gambling public gambled away $5 billion legally and an estimated $35 billion illegally. Vinny, you going to the track? Vince is the owner of Harry's Luncheonette. It's just five miles from Mammoth Raceway in Eatontown, New Jersey. When he can't break away from work for the raceway, Vince often sends a bet through a friend. But two or three times weekly, he finds at least a couple of hours in his workday to visit the track. I enjoy getting away. And this is part of my relaxation. And I like to gamble. You can make some nice money at the track. It doesn't matter how much money I get, as long as I win. I'll take a $10 adapter. One, three, three, one and $10 to win out of one. Move that last! Move that last, one's dead last. The one's dead last. Jeez. I blew that one. Vince, how, how did you do? So far, not good. How'd you do on the first race that you bet? I lost the first three races. How much money did you lose? Totally about $95. $95. So far. How do you feel right now? I'm not too happy, but uh, I'm going to get it back the next race. Next race? Yeah. 
All of it? All of it, plus, plus a profit. Vince did pick a winner in his fourth and final race of the day, allowing him to leave the track only $30 poorer than when he'd arrived. I like going home a winner, but if I lose $50 or $100 at the track, it certainly don't bother me. You know, I feel I'm entitled to that. <laughs> I don't take it away from anybody. Mm. I can lose two or 3000 but I never will, because I won't allow myself to. I love my wife and children too much. Jeopardize it. You know, my business and my family. I've seen guys go down the drain, lose their family, their wives, and their businesses and everything. My name's Joe Jean. I'm a compulsive gambler. Perhaps Vince can handle it, but some of those who could not have sought support from Gamblers Anonymous, a self-help group for compulsive gamblers. I can't relate many incidents in my life that didn't consist of some form of gambling during each and every day of the week. I gamble and gamble. I love action. Sick. The American Psychiatric Association defines compulsive gambling as a progressive behavior disorder in which an individual has a psychologically uncontrollable preoccupation and urge to gamble. The disease often takes root when a novice develops illusions of invincibility after enjoying a few early wins. I thought I was Al the Greek who was going to conquer the world. <laughs> I remember being in Atlantic City before Atlantic City <laughs> became what it is today sitting in a, in, a, in a hotel down here and maybe having $10,000 in my pocket, and I said, this is the greatest thing in the world. Shortly thereafter, everything I did went bad. For many compulsive gamblers, their gambling becomes so consuming that everything else, including family relations and vocational pursuits, falls by the wayside. And that night, you do the same thing. You call your line in, your wife's got dinner on the table, and she wants to eat. Why does she want to eat? at the time when you're going to watch all the games on a TV at 7 o'clock. I mean, that's insane. How could she want to eat before I get my scores? And then when you get all your scores, then you sit down and you eat, and then what do you do? Then you got your action to call in before the Star Spangled Banner, before the Mets, the Yankees, or whoever, at 8 o'clock. The compulsion to gamble really overpowers its victims when the luck runs dry and losses mount. Frantic efforts to win back the money puts these gamblers into deeper hock and they might eventually cheat or steal to obtain the funds with which to gamble. And uh, it came to a point where I started booking, I started uh, borrowing from shies, I started borrowing from anybody I knew. And I, I'd always have a story for them. I'd always tell them, look, don't worry, I, a little problem, uh, the guy owes me money, I'm gonna get it next week. And I'd always make up a story. And finally, there was no stories left, there was nobody else to go to because I couldn't, I couldn't continue the life I was leading anymore. When finally hitting rock bottom, a compulsive gambler will often consider suicide or seek help. And I floundered and I wandered and I uh, hoped I would die and hoped the building would cave in on me, and, uh, but it didn't. And on June 2nd, I found uh, Gambit Anonymous. This compulsive gambler, who I will call Gene, is a former lawyer. He was disbarred last year for embezzling hundreds of thousands of dollars from his clients to feed his gambling habit. Once upon a time, Gene lived here. Back then, he boasted the largest real estate practice in New Jersey, earning well over six figures. The house, the practice, the handsome income were all lost at the crap table. From very, very young, I always wanted to be a lawyer. Unfortunately, as my practice grew, my uh, taste for gambling grew uh, five times as fast. How did compulsive gambling affect your family? I didn't have them do without food or clothing or anything else. Uh, it affected them in other ways, however. I didn't pay the attention I should to them. I recall seeing my children in camp one day a year. You go up to see a camp, and I, and I couldn't even really spend a, a day with them. I had to run into town and call a bookmaker and place my bets and come back to camp and, uh, and listen to the ball games while they were participating in, uh, in events. And, and not thinking anything was wrong. When I first started going to Las Vegas, it was terrific because I won. And I thought uh, it was just easy. I was smarter than anybody else in the world. But as I increased my betting, I started to lose a little. And as I started to lose, I started to get more careless. Uh, and the more careless I got, the dumber I got in betting. It was nothing for me to go to Las Vegas and lose 50, 60, 70,000, maybe more. But Gene continued to lose.
He gambled away his savings, then money he'd borrowed from banks, and finally, money he stole from his clients' accounts. I never, ever stole anything in my entire life. I can never recall stealing a pencil. And yet, uh, here I was taking money that didn't belong to me. And my justification was, uh, um, I was borrowing it. And I, th I started to believe I was borrowing it, without question. And that's precisely the way I have to project it to a jury. In the opinion of his attorney, Donald Minns, Gene's compulsive gambling illness blinded him to the difference between borrowing and stealing, thereby making him innocent by reason of insanity. Minns employed this line of defense at Gene's trial. Of course you knew what you were doing. The question is only whether you knew that what you were doing was wrong. The jury believed the argument to a point and acquitted Gene of crimes committed in the final two months of his spree. However, he was found guilty and sentenced to four years in prison for all acts of embezzlement occurring prior to that time. This is currently on appeal. Meanwhile, Gene has picked up the pieces somewhat. He says he no longer has the urge to gamble, and he's working another job. While he is earning a more modest income than before, and he can never practice law again, Gene is happier than he's been in years. I have a choice today. I, I've gotten that choice with gamblers and honors, uh, whether to gamble or not to gamble. I choose not to gamble. The difference between now and then, it's a great feeling when you wake up in the morning and you want to live that day. It's beautiful to be alive. For the majority of people, gambling is a harmless diversion, as well as an entertaining exercise in wishful thinking. But for millions of others who are seduced by the action and consumed by the dream, gambling is an insidious activity that can inflict terrible punishment on the players and all who care about them. This report will continue with Marie Tory in just a moment. Compulsive gambling is an illness? Yes. Yes, I do. Of course it is. I think it is a sickness. It's like a drug or anything, I guess. Even the head of the New York State Racing and Wagering Board views compulsive gambling as a sickness. I, I feel it is an illness, yes. And a figure from Atlantic City's gambling industry concurs. So we're as concerned about that mental illness as we are about any other mental illness in the state. So there is general agreement that pathological gambling is an illness. But if it is an illness, why isn't there an infusion of government money into treatment of the sickness? If it is an illness, why are compulsive gamblers put in jail instead of a hospital? As the criminal justice system would like to put people in jail for uh, failing to pay bills or stealing, not realizing that they're stealing because of a habit of gambling. Monsignor Joseph Dunn, President and Executive Director of the National Council on Compulsive Gambling. And they are sick individuals now recognized by the American Psychiatric Association as an illness. Pathological gambling is a big problem in our country. It's not being recognized. It was only in 1980 that the American Psychiatric Association recognized compulsive gambling as a mental disorder. A question that arises is, what took the association so long to identify the problem when people have been known to suffer from the addiction for a multitude of years? The history books, for example, tell about literary giant Dostoevsky and the passion for gambling that plagued him and his family during the 1860s. I think the main reason it took a long time is we had very few psychiatrists involved in studying uh, compulsive gambling over a 50-year period, maybe one or two at a time and it was looked at and recognized, but we never really had a program where we collectively studied them as a large group until the uh, Veterans Administration did. Dr. Robert Custer, a chief psychiatrist with the Veterans Administration in Washington, D.C., is the nation's leading authority on compulsive gambling. He is one of a small group of authorities dedicated to seeking help and justice for the compulsive gambler, a group that sometimes feels the odds are unbeatable. The reason? A lot of people make a lot of money from gambling. Atlantic City, for example. During a one-month period, July of 1982, the nine casinos there recorded total winnings of almost $160 million. Are you saying that, that the gambling industry owes compulsive gamblers nothing? That's 
probably correct, yeah. yeah. Owes them nothing. David Gardner represents the Casino Hotel Association in Atlantic City. He feels the casinos contribute their share to social and health problems, compulsive gambling included, through corporate taxes to state and federal governments. Uh, we certainly have an obligation to discuss and have, on many occasions, discussed the problem with uh, many of the experts in the field. But do we have an obligation to solve the problem? No, we can't. Can't or will not. In reality, there is nothing wrong with compulsive gambling that money couldn't cure or arrest, as they say at Gamblers Anonymous meetings. Compared to other illnesses, it is severely underfunded. There are, for example, 4,500 treatment programs for alcoholism in the United States. Drug abuse, 2,500. Compulsive gambling, nine. Only nine treatment programs in the whole country. This is one of them. With, uh, with GA, you're still attending the GA meetings? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now, I find it's great to, to uh, um, use the both programs. I would never give up the one program I would never give up GA and just go here specifically. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. you get different things in, in the, the different programs. In GA, you get therapy of other people. You feel like you're not alone. This is a patient at St. Vincent's North Richmond Community Health Center describing to social worker Don Toms his need for treatment. Well, I mean, I lost everything. You know, I lost, I lost my wife. I lost my business because of gambling. I lost my, uh, my will to, to survive, really. I didn't really care about... Uh, if I was alive, dead or alive. And I... This modest facility, and that's an understatement, shares space with a real estate office in Staten Island. It was set up with part of the $200,000 the state of New York provided this year to help compulsive gamblers. Hardly an impressive amount compared to the four and a half million dollars the state spent on advertising its gambling activities. That's not impressive, correct, but it's impressive for me because I've uh, lived through a period when they had none. Why isn't there more concern on the part of states, on the part of just the normal citizen, about the compulsive gambler? I think, first of all, they don't recognize them because they don't stand out. They don't have any symptoms that are going to identify them. Uh, secondly, is that we've generally thought of them as having a disorder in which they're thought of as being bad and not sick. And so they feel that the legal system should deal with them, particularly if they get involved in committing a crime. Mm -hmm. And many do in order to obtain funds to continue gambling. Some don't, but the financial strain, the personal problems imposed by gambling are apparent at any OTB outlet. I'm, I'm hooked on it. There's nothing I can do about it. How, much, how much does this habit cost you? At least $1,000 a week. My family, I tell you, half of my family disowned me because of my gambling. And you still persist? Yeah, I have a sister with a million dollars in her bank. I don't even have a phone number. I'm serious. The state of New York should be appropriating between two and three million dollars a year for the uh, detection, the prevention, and the treatment of compulsive gambling. The industry should match that fund as industries uh, in, the, in the gaming area are directly connected with the problem. We provide a place for people to be entertained. Department stores provide a place for people to buy things. And there are people with compulsive shoplifting habits, kleptomaniacs. Um, I, I think it's a similar analogy. It's, it's a, something the department stores certainly can't be uh, expected to control totally, nor should casino hotels be held responsible for compulsive behavior of, of people who cannot handle gambling. I really don't feel that the casino industry feels that way. I think that is uh, so irresponsible a statement that uh, it couldn't represent what they feel. The National Commission on uh, the Impact of Gambling in Our Country indicated that availability is the key to addiction. The more people that are exposed to gambling, the more people will be addicted to it. If true, and judging from the number of states, including New York, considering legalization of casino gambling as a rich source of revenue, it's safe to predict that the ranks of compulsive gamblers will swell in the years ahead. Richard Corbusiero, executive director of New York State Racing and Wagering, sees a reason other than revenue for the state's involvement in gambling. 
Uh, you have to understand, Marie, that um, you can't legislate morality, uh, that gambling has been around almost since the beginning of time. If government was not involved in the regulation of um, gambling, uh, did not participate to the extent uh, that it does, then there's no doubt in my mind that these activities uh, would be wholly under the control of the criminal element in this state. Uh, it's no secret that the, this criminal element uh, uses the illicit profits uh, from gambling activities to infiltrate legitimate businesses and thereby destroy the, you know, the very fabric of life in, in America that we know and, and that we love. So uh, I feel that it is important that uh, government uh, be in a position uh, to regulate this activity. What I feel is the most responsible for position for any state to take is before they uh, legalize any gambling, I think they should provide within their statutes that they will provide for treatment of the casualties, the pathological gamblers they have. Well, that hasn't happened until now, has it? No. Just as warnings about the dangers of smoking are stamped on cigarette packs, Members of Gamblers Anonymous persuaded New York State officials to inscribe words of caution on off-track betting posters as well. It reads, bet with your head, not over it. Hopefully, the gambling public will heed their advice. Gamblers Anonymous is regarded as the most effective therapy available for victims of the sickness. Its success rate, 5%, just 5%. One more indication that help Funding and concern for the compulsive gambler are absolutely imperative. Fred? For Marie Torrey, I'm Fred Noriega. Thanks for joining us. We will see you next week with a new edition of Channel to the People.